right. Hello, everybody. Um, hopefully you've made your way over from First Johnny's Worship to uh, Pastor Scott's uh, announcement that he made on behalf of the board, which um, we, uh, of course, all agree with. Um, and we're not going to get too much more into that. He, uh, he uh, covered it very well, we felt. And, um, you know, one thing I'll just say quickly, the, one of the other reasons that we had felt it best to make sure we uh, just put everything on hold for a couple weeks had quite a bit to do with, uh, as you know, when you have 40 uh, plus women in the church who are in quarantine and many husbands attached to them, even if all the husbands showed up, um, if there's the possibility even one of them comes down with COVID in the next week, now we have to start this whole quarantining thing again with the men involved. Um, and so this is just a way that we can end up kind of clearing it all out within two weeks, Lord willing, and be back to to normal uh, the week of Thanksgiving. So that's it tonight. Let's uh, open our Bibles to the book of Acts. Um, I hope uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Burns, you're watching here tonight because I have a title for you. Uh, the title of tonight's message is going to be the sorcerer, the treasurer, and the persecutor. Um, he always asks me anytime I teach, because he's back there doing the sound, what's the title of the message, and I never have a title to a message. Um, so I thought when we're on Facebook Live and he really doesn't need a title, I'd give him one. All right, so Acts chapter 8 is coming right off the setting of the martyrdom of Stephen. And um, Paul, or Saul at this point, Saul of Tarsus, is first mentioned here in the um, New Testament. It's our introduction to a man who's going to have a massive impact on the early church and the rest of the writing of the New Testament, really quite a bit of it. And so uh, let's jump right in and, and, and see what God is going to do through this, this persecution that's hitting the church. Chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now Saul was consenting to his death, meaning Stephen's, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made a great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. All right, so we're just getting a, a very simple picture painted here, and that is we are standing here and Stephen is dead. And we see Saul consenting to his death, and we're told a simple fact, a great persecution is about to start in the church. This is the start of the persecution against the church because up to this point, things had gone very smoothly for the church. It had just been mostly success after success, God doing amazing things one after another. And so we're showed Stephen and Saul. Stephen is carried off by devout men, or believers who mourned for him. Um, you know, it's <laughs> we have to be careful to think that uh, even in times of martyrdom where we look back on a guy like Stephen and it's just this amazing victory for the Lord, this great message that he gives, it's going this, this tremendous testimony and you, you say, Stephen did it, he made it. But back then, for those who knew him, you know, he was more than just a guy giving a speech. He was a man who had ministered with them, ministered to people. He was one of the deacons. He had become a powerful preacher of the word of God, a powerful defender of the word of God. And they mourned him and they went off and they buried him. But we're told that Saul makes havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. We're going to take a pause there, right? Because now what we're just told is all the believers except the apostles were scattered. It was so bad that they were either dragged to prison or they fled. They just left Jerusalem. It was too much to stay there. It says in verse 4, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitude, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. 
For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. All right, so we're going to follow just one individual uh, who was sent off here, and this is actually another one of the deacons, I believe, here. And, um, yep, Philip, one of the deacons, was sent off. And it's just one of the many that was sent off. And we're told that they were all se that were sent off. They went and they preached the gospel. They preached the word. Now, that seems a little, I don't know, for me it seems a little strange. You know, the, the, when I think about, okay, persecution hits and it's di difficulty comes so great that you have to leave. And you have to pack up everything you have and get out as quick as you can. And it doesn't say that they went feeling sorry for themselves. It doesn't say that they went and sought jobs to start over. And I'm sure they did. Um, it doesn't say they complained that they complained along the way. No, it says that they went and they were preaching the word of God as they went. Now, how do you get to that point? How do you get to the point where your life just falls apart? Literally everything gone. Everything you wanted is just everything you dreamed of, everything you built, everything you had is gone. And your first thought as you're running and fleeing is... Hey, who can I tell about God? Who can I tell about the gospel? Who needs to be saved? That is what they did. Well, I think the answer is pretty simple, is that only happens if that's what you're doing before you had to flee. You see, they understood and took very seriously what Jesus taught. Jesus told them, if, you, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And so they were ready for it. And when the persecution came, because they had made their lives that they had built in Jerusalem, they had given that up already for Christ's sake. So when the time came that they couldn't live them anymore, well, it didn't matter as much because all they had to do was continue doing what they were somewhere else. They had to continue with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Philip heads off to Samaria. Remember, Samaria had been the capital of Israel, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, a place of great idolatry. Um, the Samaritans now lived there. They were the half-breeds that the Jews hated. You can go back in the Gospels and see how people... <sighs> The fact that Jesus went there just blew people's minds. They couldn't understand, Jesus, what are you doing here? Even the Samaritans didn't grasp what he was doing there. It was strange to them that he would show up. Well, Philip shows up, and he just starts preaching the gospel, and they're amazed, and he's doing signs and wonders in there. And they're all just, their minds are blown. There's wor the word being spoken power. There's demons being cast out. There's lame and paralyzed people being healed. And they're just, it says not only that they were amazed, but you got to see it in verse eight, there was great joy in that city. You see right there, that's how you know this wasn't just another, hey, the crowds followed. This was people getting saved. Joy entered their hearts. And we're going to see why that's a big deal here in the next section. Because the people had been essentially living under the thumb of a sorcerer in Samaria. And that's a little odd to us in America. Now, I've been told if you talk to missionaries who have been to places like Africa or Latin American countries, South America, this is not odd at all. That there are villages that are in the sway of witch doctors and sorcerers all the time, and they live under that heavy yoke. But there had been a man there named Simon who practiced sorcery. And because he did some pretty amazing things that people couldn't explain, it says that all listened to him from the least to the greatest in the city. But even this man, when he heard Philip's teaching, he believed. And he became a believer, and not just became a believer. It says that he continued with Philip and was amazed as he saw the signs and miracles that were done. Now, moving on. 
Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, and they had only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that any one on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent thereof of your wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart might be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. And Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, so that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. All right. There's a couple really interesting things that go on here. And, and some of them, and, and this is where as we read the scriptures, especially book like a book like Acts or even in the Gospels, you can do a little bit of reading in between the lines. I want you to know something, that it says the apostles who were left at Jerusalem, they heard that Samaria had received the word of God. Not that the word had been preached, but they received it, that it had been gladly received. And so what did they do? They sent Peter and John. Reading behind the lines here, one of the things you can see is we don't have a real hierarchy amongst the apostles here, that the apostles sent Peter and John. And if you follow the pattern they've done every other time in the book of Acts, my guess is they prayed and the Spirit said, send Peter and John, and they went. This is not Peter being in charge here. This isn't Peter deciding, I'll take myself and John because we've been to Samaria before. You know, I have to imagine it was Peter and John were probably, uh, I don't know if we use the term excited, a little apprehensive perhaps. I imagine excited, but they had to think back. Do you remember going with Jesus to Samaria? Do you remember what happened with the woman at the well? Do you remember how he said we must needs go to Samaria? And here they are years, a couple years later, right? Showing up in Samaria, seeing the gospel just take root, knowing that they had been part of that with Jesus, those seeds being planted before, being received, and now bearing fruit. And who got to have the honor of that? Philip, one of the deacons, one of the seven. That it would have been easy to say, oh yeah, you know what, oh the apostles are too good to wait on tables. See, that wasn't the heart at all. It was, right, there's work that the apostles had assigned to them, and they should not leave it. So the God had appointed other men to do this work, and God honored it. And now God is following the principle, if you are faithful in what you are called to now, he builds upon that. And so now you have a man, Philip, just like you had a man, Stephen, whose whole calling was to wait on tables and to make sure that the widows get their food well, now Stephen was preaching, Stephen was contending for the faith, and Stephen ended up being the what we call the first martyr, though, as I had one Bible teacher in school say the first martyr was really Lazarus, because he's the one who had to come back from heaven. Um, but Stephen, right, the first traditional martyr, and now here we have Philip, another one of the deacons who now is sent out and leading this amazing revival in Samaria. And it's interesting because... This really, it's, this account is not about, it's not about uh, Philip, and it's not really about Peter, and it's not really about John. It's about this man named Simon, and he was a sorcerer. And the man gets saved, and he comes to know the Lord, and he's walking. There's no doubt, it says he believed, and he was baptized, so we have no reason to believe he was unsaved at this point. But he clearly had very flawed understanding. You see, this was not a man who was an agnostic. This was not a man who was uh, an atheist. This was a man who was very spiritually astute before. And in fact, had used it much to his profit and to control the city. This was his understanding of what spirituality was about. And so when he sees they come and lay hands, the disciple, uh, the apostles lay hands that they might receive the Holy Spirit, he wants in on this. 
You see, and so much that he says, guys, if you teach me to do this, I'll pay you. I'll give you money for the knowledge of how to do this. And Peter here receives what we would call, as far as the spiritual gifts go, a word of knowledge. That the Lord reveals something to him. And Peter doesn't mince words, right? Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. You know, this is a very interesting contrast that we see. It makes me think of when Aquila and Priscilla have to take Apollos aside and they have to correct his his is incomplete knowledge of the plan of salvation, right? He was preaching the gospel of John. Philip, when he came, was preaching the gospel of Jesus, but they hadn't gotten into the Holy Spirit stuff. Philip apparently did not have the ability or feel comfortable laying on hands on people and letting the Holy Spirit be received by them. And so John and Peter come and they do this. And as John and Peter are coming to do this, you know, Simon is just blown away. He's just seen miracle after miracle, wonder after wonder. And now he's seen, wait, this very thing that's allowing Philip to do it, we can all do it. You're just giving this away freely. And now he goes, I want to do this. Now, does this harken back to him wanting to control things? Maybe. Is this a way that he thinks, hey, there was nothing wrong with what I was doing before other than I didn't know the truth. So I'm going to keep doing what I was, I'll just do it with the Holy Spirit instead. In all likelihood, that's what he's thinking at this point. And Peter is given that insight into his heart, and he is not going to let this happen. And whereas Aquila and Priscilla have to correct Apollos, and we see that, oh, they kind of take him aside and just gently correct him and show him the right way, Peter is very harsh with him. You know, it'd be easy, I think, in our own world today, if we saw someone who was a new believer and someone talked like that to a new believer, wow, we would probably be like, hold on, you understand, they're just a new believer. Take you, take it easy. They don't know any better. But I think the truth is, Peter, with what he saw, does know better. See, he knows where this will go. And it'd be also very easy to think that this was purely Simon being greedy, Simon thinking he could manipulate too, which there might have been a heart of it, but the word of knowledge that Peter receives has to do with his heart, that his heart has been poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. It's an interesting question. What made this man bitter? What made this man who he is? What experiences did he have that he wanted power, that he wanted influence, that he wanted to rule instead of be ruled over? Obviously, something had caused that bitterness in his heart, which then had led to the iniquity. And Peter just points it out immediately and in a way that cannot be ignored. But I love it. Simon's response is, pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. See, Simon doesn't deny it. Simon doesn't say, hey, um, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about, Peter. How dare you say that to me? Who are you to judge me, right? He doesn't pull out, like many today probably would, is judge not that you may not be judged. No, he knows it. It rings true in his heart. And we see a heart that desires to repent here. And that's what we learn of Simon. Now, we'll come back and, and, and tie this all up, but I'm going to leave it there with Simon for a moment. In verse 25 says, So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So they're not just there in Samaria, but they are hitting up every spot that they can. And it says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So when he arose and went... And behold, the man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge over all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him 
and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. And place the scripture at the place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation for his life was taken from the earth? So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning in the scriptures, he preached Jesus to him. See, this is so cool. All right. Um, Philip is in the middle of this hugely successful revival and the Lord says, leave. Doesn't make sense. Why wouldn't you stay? Why wouldn't you enjoy the fruit of your labor? Nope. Says, go. I've got another job for you. Walk out in all places. Where, Lord? Oh, go into the wilderness. Take that road down towards Gaza. This is all desert. But notice what he does. He obeys. He just goes. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. I have been very hit and miss in my own life with this. But I can tell you from the experiences of the times I've done this right, it always works. Obedience. Simple obedience to what God asks you to do. A lot of the time when God tells us to do something, it doesn't make sense. Why would you leave Samaria? Why would you walk into the desert? Why would you do any of that? When the Lord wakes you up at 10, 12, 2 in the morning, whatever it is, and says, I want you to go down to the nice and easy. I want you to go out to and take a walk. Um, two in the afternoon, I want you to go talk to your neighbor. It's so easy to question it. It's so easy to be like, Lord, no, no, you really don't want me to do that. I must have just been making that up myself. I, I, I didn't really hear you, did I? It's so easy to do that. But every time we obey, we will find there's a reason for it. And the Lord usually makes it abundantly clear. And every time, I mean, let's face it, don't we all sometimes live a little bit in dread of the Lord tapping us on the shoulder and saying, see that per complete stranger over there? I want you to go and tell them about me. I'm sure we have all, if you've walked long enough with the Lord, we have all had that happen. But here's one of the cool things that we see. And this is a pattern I always find. The Lord doesn't tell us to go share the gospel specifically like that very often without first preparing the person's heart. Philip had no idea what was going on, but it just so happened, right? Just so happens that as soon as he gets up there, he says to him, he, he actually heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. So he's reading it out loud and he's like, oh Lord, man, this is easy. This is great. He's already reading the Bible. I mean, this isn't even a Jew as far as we know. It's it's possible, I guess it's argued, he could have been a Jew and um, there were Jews down in that area coming back. But he's reading the Bible already. I mean, how much easier would it be if the Lord said, I want you to go share the gospel with somebody and you look over and you see they have their Bible open already. You'd be like, okay, that's easy. I'm in. Um, so he walks right up. And, and not only that, but the scripture is about Jesus being crucified and slaughtered for our sins. And talk about an open door. I mean, he didn't even have to use a track, no million dollar bill. He didn't have to do a good test. He didn't have to come up with some clever way to see it because the Lord had already laid it out. The Lord had already said, oh, by the way, here's your opening. Just walk through the door right now. And that's all he did. He declares Jesus to him. How easy is that? All right. Um, moving on. Uh, he goes on to say, if they went on the road and they came to some water and the eunuch said, see here, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And then he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, 
and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. All right. Um, so we see here again, very basic, very simple obedience being done here. He knows that its Bible says, believe and be baptized. So the eunuch, he sees here, he believes. As they go down the road, he sees water and he says, what hinders me from being baptized? And then it's simple. Okay, what's the condition on being baptized? If you believe with all your heart, then you may. And we get the confession of faith from the Ethiopian eunuch. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he's baptized. And then the Lord is going to do another amazing sign. And we would see this in the book of Acts in a number of times after he does signs and wonders. Uh, often he does signs and wonders. Sometimes it is with uh, speaking in tongues. Sometimes it's, there's other miracles accompanying it. And this time, as soon as he comes out of the water, Philip is just swept away. And so the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. He's probably in awe. He's probably wondering, where did this man go? But he has no doubt that the experience is real. And so he goes on his way rejoicing, and we find Philip now at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And there we have it, more preaching of the word of God. All right, so we get through the sorcerer, and we get through the, uh, the treasurer now. Now, this is what's very interesting about it. And, you know, it's so easy to form judgments in our heart, right? It's so easy when we're doing ministry of any sorts. We have these ideas of who, who can be saved, who can't be saved, where someone's at. Often we just look at external things. If someone looks like a mess, if somebody looks, uh, you know, if they don't fit our idea of what someone who's in a good place or a right place to be saved is, we can kind of start picking and choosing who we minister to. You know, and that's one of the things that God has, is it's just, his grace goes far beyond anything we can imagine. God's grace is for people of any race. God's grace is for people of any social economic status. It doesn't matter what country you were born in. It doesn't matter if you're living on the streets or you're living in the White House or you're living in a, million, a mansion that costs hundreds of millions of dollars. We're all in need of Christ. We are all in need of salvation. And God sends here just one man who was sent out of Jerusalem because of persecution, sent as he is. And here he comes into Samaria. And of all the people, lots of people get saved, but a sorcerer of all people. You know, these are the kinds of people you sit there and you think you're going to show up on the missionary field and they're going to be your enemy. They're going to be the ones that they're going to fight against the word of God. He didn't. He got saved. He's the one who gets saved. And I'm sure he had to have been the last one, let alone, I mean, like, first the thought that Samaritans would even get saved to the Jewish mind, right, would be quite remarkable. But the fact that Samaritan, not only Samaritan, but a sorcerer would get saved is amazing. And then out of nowhere, he's whisked away and sent into the wilderness. And he sees this grand caravan carrying a, an official of the queen of Ethiopia. And I mean, like the Lord just says, go. I mean, I mean, let's face it. If we saw an official delegation driving by in a motorcade, or if we were in New York City walking by the United Nations and seeing all these ambassadors, might be a little intimidated thinking, oh, well, go preach to one of them. Why would we do that? But what, what, why would they want Jesus, right? And it's so easy to do that. And we have to be very careful and understand that in God's eyes, we are all the same. 
We are all sinners in need of salvation. And now we are going to come to <laughs> what many would consider the greatest work, even though it's not. We know it's not the greatest work that God is doing, but it is a work of salvation. Saul enters the scene again. We've seen a sorcerer get saved. We've seen a treasurer get saved, a man of power and position get saved, a respectable man of power and position get saved. And now we are going to see the persecutor. Chapter 9 starts off saying, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, that means Christians, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice and seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And so he was three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. You know, one thing that, <laughs> and we always want to be careful. We, we don't want to speculate too much, and, and particularly when it comes to motivations and such. But there, there's part of me that just looks at this and says, okay, Philip, I'm going to send you on your way here, and I've got a sorcerer, and, and we're going to get the word out in Samaria. You're going to have a sorcerer get saved, and I've got a nice big, big government bigwig for you to preach the gospel to. But you know what? I'm going to take Saul myself, right? And, and we'll find out, right, that there is a very specific reason the Lord does this. Paul, when he's writing uh, in his letters, references this idea that it wasn't a man who taught him the gospel of Jesus Christ. That the Lord appeared to him. That the Lord proclaimed himself to him. We know that the Lord met with him not only here, but at other times, and, and taught him that it wasn't, he didn't go to the apostles in Jerusalem to get his training. He didn't go to Bible college for it. But the Lord himself taught him. And that's the thing, is when the Lord shows up, who can fight against it? So Saul, still breathing out threats and murder, against the disciples of the Lord. He goes, he gets his permission to go into Damascus because he's already pretty much cleaned house in Jerusalem. You can see how it is. Jerusalem, we were told at the beginning of chapter 8, was persecuted to the point that pretty much only the apostles were left. So he's cleaned house in Jerusalem and now he's saying, where's the next place? We're going to the next town. We're taking this show on the road and we're going to get rid of Christians there too. He had to feel good about it. He had to feel confident about the work he was doing. We're told that he did it out of zeal. He writes it himself. He thought he was doing the right thing out of his love for God. But he knew nothing of it. He knew absolutely nothing of it. Because the love of God was about to show up. And as he's on his way, suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice. Right, The famous line, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? You know, we talked about this a little bit Sunday night when we were doing Genesis. Um, the Lord starts with a question. More often than not, not, the vast majority of the times, the Lord approaches us with a question. Why? We said it Sunday night because the question opens our mind. It opens our hearts to consider and so Saul, he has to answer this question honestly when the Lord says, why are you persecuting me? See, 
Saul thinks he's persecuting the church. Saul thinks he's persecuting heretics and blasphemers. But the Lord gets to the heart. You're not persecuting them. You're persecuting me. And instantly he says, who are you, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Jesus. And right to the point again, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And by that we learn that Saul had a prick in his conscience. Something going against, he was kicking against the goad. So the idea is he's fighting against the grain. He's pushing and forcing himself to go in a direction he knows he shouldn't be going. And so the heart gets revealed. This so often happens with the Lord. And, and guys, let me tell you this. When you're struggling, I found it true in my life. And I know many, many of my friends who've walked with the Lord for years will tell you the same thing. When we come to him in prayer, if he shows you something about your own heart, do not ignore it. It is always to the point. The Lord doesn't waste words. He doesn't waste time. He always goes straight to the heart of what we need and what we're dealing with. Even if we think it doesn't make any sense. Even if we go, what does that have to do with anything, Lord? I guarantee you it does. He did it with Simon the sorcerer. It was a root of bitterness in his life that had bound his heart with iniquity. The Ethiopian eunuch... He just needed to figure out what the scripture said. This was a man who just didn't have a clue what was written. And he just needed someone to show him. And so the Lord provides it. And here with Saul, he's saying, you know better. You're persecuting me and I am Jesus. And instantly he says, what do you want me to do? Again, look at that obedience. He's willing to obey immediately. He not only is willing to obey, but he asks, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, arise and go in the city and you will be told what you must do. And he was blind. And it says he was three days without sight and he neither ate nor drank. Wisely, he goes right into prayer and fasting. He's, the Lord has spoken to him. He's left blind and he's waiting. And so he's praying and fasting. And now there was a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard about from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentile kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. I think I would have had the very same reaction as Ananias. You know, it's funny though, right? The man who's persecuting the church, the Lord shows up and says, Saul, what are you doing? Why are you persecuting me? Lord, who is this? Uh, it's me, Jesus. You're kicking against the goads. You're persecuting me. What do you want me to do, Lord? Lord tells him he instantly does it. Shows up to Ananias and says, hey, I've got a job for you. I want you to go to this guy's house. Here's his address. There's a guy, Saul of Tarsus, there praying. He knows you're coming. You're going to tell him about me. You're going to put hands on him. So he, you're going to heal him of his blindness. Pretty straightforward instructions. I, I mean, let's face it. You know, I've been working in youth ministry for a long time. I once upon a time was a youth myself, as all of us were. And we all know that moment where we just wish the Lord would be clear. Lord, show me everything you want me to do for the rest of my life. I don't have a clue who I'm supposed to marry, where I'm supposed to go to college. I mean, if the Lord literally showed up and said, okay, here's the address of the place you're going to go to college, just send in your application and show up there, we'd be like, great, that's exactly what I was looking for. And this is the kind of direction Ananias gets. Show up this street, this house, there's a guy there, Saul of Tarsus, praying. He knows you're coming. Lay hands on him and heal him from his blindness. And the first thing Ananias says is, uh, Lord, do you know who he is? 
Lord, um, this is the guy who has done great, great harm to your church and your saints. The implication is, why are you messing around with this guy, Lord? Uh, and why do you want to heal this guy, Lord? And the Lord is gracious with Ananias. The Lord just says, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name. And after that, Ananias, I give him credit. I mean, he questioned, but I give him credit because it only took him one more go before he went. I can't tell you how many times it takes me at least six or seven goes before I go. Um, and again, something that I think we all need to work on. I, I know I need to work on. But, uh, you know, that there's a struggle sometimes to obey, right? It, it can be a struggle to obey. And simply to go with that blind, childlike faith. Well, the Lord said, do this, so I'm going to go do it. He said, go here, I'm going to go here. And so, Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I love it. Ananias got the message loud and clear. And hopefully we have the heart of Ananias because Ananias says what right away? Brother Saul. All right, the Lord said you're saved. I'm gonna give it to you. You're saved. Brother Ananias, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the... Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. So there was something physically on his eyes blinding him. And he received his sight at once. And he arose. And again, here we have it, was baptized. And then he received food and he was strengthened. And Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. And and this is no surprise, right? With what we know of Saul, and soon to be Paul, in the book of Acts, it says immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God, and all who heard were amazed. He said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on the name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now, this is really cool because... What we find out is Saul's mission to Damascus was no secret. They knew he was coming. This was planned. This was open. And Ananias was, knew what was going on. Um, the Jews knew what was going on. And they're all amazed because of what God did. So we have a sorcerer get saved. We have a high-ranking government official get saved. And we have a persecutor get saved. And where did this all start? It all started with the persecution of the church. There are a lot of people out there, and I can be one of them, that don't like the idea of persecution, that don't like the idea of discomfort. None of us do. I mean, who would, right? Who wants your life thrown upside down like this? But I want to show you something here. The heart of of the church was they went. And guys, think about it. this is essentially just following one little thread that left Jerusalem with the persecution that started at the feet of Stephen's throwing the cloaks at Saul's feet when Stephen died. It all started there and the persecution that went out from there. You see, God does things we can't possibly imagine. God uses people we can't possibly imagine. It's so easy to get this idea of what God is going to do in our heads. Often it's just based on what he's done in the past. God will, oh, God uses this kind of person. Oh, God uses that kind of person. Oh, God could never save someone like that. Or we don't really mean to say that, right? But what we mean to say, someone like that would never be interested in getting saved. See, there's one thing that is common to the human condition. In our heart of hearts, we all know we need something more than this world offers. And so we need to not be afraid of what the Lord sends our way to get us where we need to be for his kingdom's sake. And you know what? That might be 
something as drastic as what happened way back here in Jerusalem, where persecution came, people were killed, people were arrested, and people fled, but they fled bringing the gospel to, you know what, that might be if you're a kid listening right now, maybe your friends in school don't want to talk to you anymore because they, you believe in Jesus, but the Lord is going to use that to help you reach out to another kid who wants to hear the name of Jesus and needs to hear the name of Jesus. Maybe that would happen at our workplaces. Maybe that would happen in our friend groups and in our but, you know, whether you're part of a golf league, a softball league, whatever it is, um, the Lord will do anything for his kingdom. And when we sign on, we sign on to be used by him. And so, guys, my encouragement to you tonight is twofold. Whatever the Lord uses to get us going, we should be grateful for. And whenever we're moved out of a place we would naturally stay, open your eyes. Look for what the Lord may be wanting you to do so we don't waste that opportunity because surely the Lord is going to do something. So Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come before you uh, with your word and to open it. Lord, we pray for all those right now who are sick, um, Lord, we pray that you keep those who are not sick from getting sick, Lord. We pray for these two weeks that our ladies are in quarantine, that you would be merciful to them, that you would use this as a time of refreshment, um, not only from the busyness of life, but a time to be refreshed in your word, a time to sit at your feet and to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, I hope you all have a wonderful night and God bless you all.